How are you? <laughs> Greetings from Toronto. It's actually getting warmer. So excited. Still haven't changed the tires of my car <laughs> because we, we might have that last minute blizzard in April. So my winter tires are still on my car. Oh, well. Hope you guys are out there getting outside, taking care of yourselves, taking care of each other. Um, maybe getting your vaccines, that'd be so great. Um, yeah, Ontario is actually in another lockdown for probably the rest of the month, which is pretty big. Um, so that's too bad, but I have my bike ready. I'm going to start riding my bike around. More importantly, hoping that you guys are out there and able to do some really continual good change for our society and using your voices for the good. Hi, Dave. All right. So let's add you to the call. Yeah. For you guys to meet my friend Dave, maybe you already know him, but this is going to be great. I was like, hi! Hi, Anne. How are you? Hey, I'm so good. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Let me just uh, prop that. Do you hear me and see me okay? Yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, so where are you right now? I am at First Baptist. Okay. And uh, we are in the, mid in the middle of a big move. Oh. Um, we are um, oh. We're going to be displaced for two years. Oh my goodness! So we, this week is one of the the bigger weeks for the for the move. We have to be out of here by the end of the month, but um, wow! Yeah, so we're, we're packing the kitchen this mm. week, and uh, since I'm the the coordinator, the director for the street ministries, they, uh, the kitchen is a big part. So. Oh my goodness, that's yeah. your job to pack up the kitchen? Well, no, we have a, a good group of volunteers, a lovely group of. Um, of um, uh, volunteers but I just I, I had to yes. you know, give them instructions and yes and all that and, and wow. but so yeah we have a big construction going on yeah so you mean by telling everybody that you guys are moving you mean your church yes so your whole church is being mm -hmm. displaced <laughs> yes where are you going pardon where are you relocating well, there is a couple options. Well, not options, but um, there's going to be. A, we're gonna record the services for the near future in um, uh, in the Coastal Church, which is on Commercial Drive here in Vancouver. Oh, okay. And then after a, a couple months, we're gonna record the services in um, uh, right across the street, uh, Saint Andrew Wesley. Uh, so we're. Um, we're gonna be there, but I say recording because, um, of course, we're um, uh, during COVID we can't have um, uh, uh, you know gatherings. Right. So, but hopefully uh, the pandemic will uh, will you know, go away and yeah. um, That'd be nice. uh, this year, so we can gather. And once we can gather, we'll we'll be at um, Saint Andrews Wesley. Okay. Great. Hmm. So not too far, just across the street. Just across the street, yeah. So. Whoa, that's big. Mm -hmm. wow. Perfect timing for you to come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's in. It was a big decision to to make this change uh, from you know theological education in Latin America to street ministries here in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, one of the reasons why I accepted was the whole challenge of doing hospitality ministries uh, without a building. Yeah, wow. What does that look like? So it's, um, it's, it's some days I'm like, this is exciting because Jesus didn't have a place to host people, you know? Wow. Uh, and then some days I'm like, oh man, what? Uh, this is a lot more complicated. You know? uh, maybe it wasn't a good idea. You know? yeah. But no, it's and m most of the time we're um, it, we're in a creative period, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, there's just fabulous stuff here at First Baptist. So, oh man, I'm excited for you. 
I totally, I'm like, I never even thought about the fact that, you know, Jesus didn't have a, a building, you know, he didn't have any, anywhere to put his head. So I'm like, wow. But I think that all of this whole pandemic thing, and then your move is just forcing us to be really creative in good Absolutely. ways. Yeah, 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 you have to rethink uh, some of the things that, um, that you held as very, um, very secure. Yeah. Um, including your own abil your own abilities uh, to to, you know, to adapt and all those things, but yes, it's just like I was mentioning uh, the the book of Ecclesiastes is sort of a good um, good book for me to read this time and mm. navigate the pandemic with some of Coelho's uh, insights. Yeah, what's the book called again? Oh, Ecclesiastes, sorry. Oh, yes. Ecclesiastes, yes, that yes. book. Okay. Yeah, so, that one. <laughs> yeah, that one. Okay, this is so good. I just want to start off by saying hi. I'm so glad. Thanks for your time. And mm -hmm. I, I'm i so glad that we've known each other for a million years now. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, yes, we were students. Yeah, I'm like at Regent College in Vancouver. And I, oh, I'm actually really jealous that you're there right now because it's springtime in Vancouver is perfect yeah it yeah yes i thank you i mean it, it is nice we did arrive in Jan, in in december you know okay. uh, which was cold and dark yeah and uh, and a weird christmas sort of thing because you couldn't really see tough. people but uh so springtime is yeah vancouver is just gorgeous isn't it yeah. so you have to go and hug a tree for me and smell some flowers i will i will i will hug a tree for you Thanks. Okay, I would love for us to start our time. If you could just introduce yourself to everybody. Who are you? Where? I don't, you've, you're a global citizen. Mm -hmm. I'd love to, to know more about you. Well, my name is David Nacho. I was born in Bolivia. Uh, I lived in Canada uh, for, for several years. Uh, and, uh, you know, where I finished my my uh, degree in communications, which I had started in Bolivia. And then oh. I uh, started uh, Regent College, where I met you. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of degrees there, I uh, got married and um, I started working as a missionary uh, with Susanna and, uh, in several Latin American countries. So, um, you know, we were invited to first go to El Salvador, work with oh. uh, a very... Um, very active church there among uh, among the poor and even like sort of um, very um, cutting edge if you want around political issues. It was an interesting uh, experience for us. And then um, for the last ten years, we've worked on uh, I worked on theological education, um, both as faculty in the seminary in Bolivia, uh, but. Uh, a big part of my vocation actually took place as uh, as the academic dean of uh, of uh, SETI, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Community. We call it <laughs> uh, Community for Interdisciplinary Theological Studies, which is um, one of the first uh, um, graduate programs mm -hmm. in theology that emerged in Latin America. And one of the first at uh, distance, you know, back then in the early 80s was a, was a distance program. Uh, but it was thought in, um, in a very different uh, manner from other programs. So rather than um, uh, having it sort of similar to region, actually. So rather than having uh, the training of pastors as its main focus or program, the, you know, the SETI, the, the visionaries and founders, um, thought that it was key to train the whole people of God, so theology yes. for the laity. Right. But what they did was uh, structure the program uh, around uh, areas of life rather than around disciplines of theology. Oh. So, yeah, the, the whole program was designed, uh, a graduate program designed around four areas of life church, family, work, and society. Mm. So within those areas, you, you see uh, this, uh, different disciplines of, um, uh, of theology, uh, different topics, but it forces you to always um, 
consider the ethical implications of your reflection, yeah. uh, the, you know, wow. the contextual richness of a particular mm -hmm. point of view. Uh, so we, um, so yeah, we, we worked there for 10 years and um, then that took us to, um, to Costa Rica for about four years, which was lovely uh, uh, and hard to leave. But uh, but then it was it was a good time for for us to to move um, back to Canada where we both met and studied uh, and um, take on a different kind of ministry. Um, one of our uh, dear professors, the Regent um, Charles Ringma, I'm sure you remember him. I love Ringma. He, he yeah he always used to say like um, if you're in any sort of uh, education or formation ministry. Make sure you you take time away from it oh, and uh, wow. and spend time um, uh, with the people doing uh, doing things that are um, let's wow. call them practical. You no, know, just sort of get your get your hands dirty because that will keep you real. That will keep you uh, yeah engaged. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's a sort of thing. So we I always kept that in, in my heart, but. Uh, it was it was also something that um, remember Paul Stevens uh, should used to say too like you know you you cannot uh, be you cannot do theology of work so long that uh, uh, and not be in the marketplace uh, for so long because you lose contact with the market marketplace so you start theologizing about ideas of ideas uh, you know. <laughs> So yeah, so we want to take the next few years to to engage in, in on the streets with our local congregation and that kind of stuff. Oh man, thank you so much for explaining. I think you're explaining why you're back in Vancouver and doing this ministry and the with First Baptist with uh, people in the downtown east side in Vancouver. So man, okay, that's awesome. I love Ringma. I also love Paul Stevens. And I, so I, it makes so much sense to stay engaged because I think if you're in academics for way too long, and I'm get, probably going to get a lot of flack on this, but like that you just start getting detached from reality and society and what people are really grappling with. So, um, okay, I'm going to tell a story of a memory that we I had with you kind of. Uh -oh. In Jakarta. <laughs> a good story. Always okay. good. <laughs> so one one thing was I think the last time I saw you in person was in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. Um we were both invited to four years ago maybe was it to the younger leaders gathering for the Lausanne movement. And I think you flew all the way around the world from where were you in Costa Rica? From Bolivia. I was in Bolivia. Oh, yeah. Goodness. That's even farther. Okay, so Bolivia all the way over. Anyway, yeah. so I'm going to say hi to your friends. <laughs> hi, everyone. I see. I see. Uh, I, I'm not very good at this, but I, I think I see Yare. Very <laughs> nice. Jonathan, saludos. Ah, Melanie. Saludos. Oh, awesome. Yeah, thanks. So good. All right. Anyway, welcome, you guys. Um, So Jakarta, basically, you rolled up in the bus you had just arrived and i was walking up to the buses and you popped out and i was like hey dave like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we hadn't seen each other really okay but here's my memory um you met this other lady who also stud studied at regent college i think she was from central asia and you guys were at a cafe and i yeah. walked in on you guys having coffee at this <laughs> i love indonesian coffee but um oh and I was like, this is amazing. Two people from region, one guy from Bolivia, another lady from Central Asia, having coffee together in Indonesia. And I said, what are you guys talking about? Because I was like, I want to hang out too. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, her response was, I am learning everything that David is doing in Latin America. And it's incredible. She's like, I don't even want to go back to Vancouver. I don't want to go back to region. I just want to go back to my country and my region of the world and do exactly what he's doing in Latin America and contextualize mm -hmm. theology for Central Central Asia. And I was like, yes, I think this is what the church should be doing. This is the global church at its beautiful best. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and I remember that that day. It was, it was a beautiful uh, conversation too with Yelena. Yeah, 
So way to go. You're inspiring people from all over the world. Mm, thanks. <laughs> so thanks. then, okay. But talking Thank about you. Indonesian coffee, though, that, um, oh. yes, well, there's, there's the one that, uh, the, the Kopi Luwak one, the one that, yes. that those, those monkeys poop and then, <laughs> so which is incredible. But then we also, you know, we also had this coffee that is made with this flower or something like that. Oh. That that smells like like oh. death. Um, what? I, I don't remember the name of it. It's something that smells so incredibly strong. And I remember a group of us saying, you know, we're well-traveled uh, people, you know, cultural, culturally sensitive and all that. So let, let's order that, right? Because there's a... Is the, the Indonesian co specialty coffee, and none of us could, uh, yeah, like we all had to admit defeat because it was just uh, oh. was there. I, I have to remember <laughs> the name of the flower or, or fruit. I think it was a fruit. Yes, oh. uh, just um, it was an interesting. I don't remember. It wasn't durian. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. It smells really bad. Yeah, yeah. It was just like, yeah. It's horrible, right? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> but for to anyone who loves that, um, I just couldn't. Uh, yeah. I had it for the first time a couple of years ago, and actually, it doesn't taste terrible. You know, you can get gelato flavors. Oh. oh. Durian flavored gelato, and in Vancouver, because I oh. had it. Well, I saw it. And they cover that one because they don't want the smell to infect all the other gelato. Right. Okay. <laughs> oh, interesting. You have to be brave for those. Well, you should go get some gelato. Yes, and there's good gelato in Vancouver. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to explain the Cafe Lua, though, to everybody. <laughs> the, yeah, the, well, it's it's apparently these, uh, these grains uh, that are... Um, eaten and digested by the, I think the, the, the copy is the little animal that you know, yeah. eats, eats it. And uh, I think it's best when it's done in the wild. So <laughs> people go and collect the, the, the they eat the, the bean, but <laughs> they, they, they poop the, 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 the seed, right? Which is the actual yeah, coffee bean. So do. people collect those and uh, roast, uh, wash it of course yes thank you <laughs> and, uh, and then roast it i ro roast those beans and they taste incredible it's yeah like, i've had it yes it's it's unbelievable like how yeah but uh, that's the process yeah, yeah. Um, indonesia was this yeah it's an amazing place it was so funny let's mm -hmm. go and drink the coffee that's been processed mm -hmm. through the little body of, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. i don't know what it is but a monkey anyway i agree Oh, hi, Brooke. <laughs> nice to see you. All right. Well, anyway, that was my memory. And so I was just like, okay, before we start talking about Ecclesiastes, which is still the topic, <laughs> I would just really love for you to talk to us about what does it mean to contextualize theology for Latin America? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? I don't know. What, well, I mean, I'm... Um... I think I, I should start by saying that theology is always always uh, responding to somebody's questions. Mm. So there is no theology that is not doing that. Mm. Uh, and that's, it, uh, it, um, you know, it, in the, for instance, Reformed theology is addressing uh, 16th, 17th century, um, mostly Catholic, I suppose, uh, at that time, um, Europe and the sort of uh, debates and, and social realities that were happening then. Uh, so um, recognizing that fact that theology is addressing a society or, or individuals' questions about uh, reality as they experience as they experience it, mm -hmm. then you uh, you can become a little bit more honest about how you do theology and. Uh, Call yourself into um, into account, or or you know, be be accountable to to who you are entering into conversation with when you're doing theology. Mm -hmm. So um, when Latin American contextual theology emerged um, in in 
both in the Catholic uh, uh, and the Protestant uh, um, communities, uh, the the social upheaval, you know, the Cold War and all those things were the realities of the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and theology was, uh, I think, in a very um, honest, and you can disagree or, or you can critique or you can uh, agree and, uh, and, and further their, their, their research. Uh, and their reflection, but it was an, uh, it was this engagement, uh, this honest engagement with the disciplines, with the currents, with the culture of the time. So that's what contextual theology is, and what it looks like in Latin America. Uh, again, it, it emerged in a particular context, mm-hmm. um, but my vocation in all of that was to say, okay, well, we're not in that context anymore. Mm-hmm. So if we keep mm-hmm. uh, um, if we keep answering the questions that Latin Americans had um, 50 years ago, then we're no longer doing contextual theology in Latin America. Wow! We yes. Have to pay attention to the of today. So, for instance, a big question today is deforestation, mm-hmm. right? I mean, or um, in in Latin America, or uh, or violence, which I will talk about later, but. Uh, so those are the the things that um, the questions that make theology contextual. Uh, but again, like it's contextual because we label it like that. I, I think um, the the bigger point I'm trying to make is that all theology is engaging with somebody's questions, yeah. and the more honest we're about it, the better. Mm. Thank you, man. That really helps because I you. That theology is always like, I think what you're saying in response to people's questions. Um, so that is awesome. And because I think that a lot of people have questions. And so I actually wanted to ask your opinion on what do you think is happening currently in maybe Latin America and in North America? Because I think a lot of people are asking questions about the faith that we've been given mm-hmm. and that we have received. And I think, well, I think, like I think the word decolonizing our faith, right? Of just reevaluating what we have been taught versus what what are the current challenges for that we're dealing with today? And I think a lot of people are feeling sad, like also um, detaching as well from their churches and feeling really mm-hmm. low. So, um, but actually, I was having a conversation yesterday with somebody where I think we have to engage and have those critical conversations about our faith in the current context of today, because um, otherwise it's a stagnant faith. If we don't have those really difficult, hard conversations that, but we need to really examine um, our faith and how it, how is it substantial and how is it good news today? Do you have thoughts on that? Well, um, if, if I may quote Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, uh, I think a, a perennial and relevant question uh, as we do theology is one that was, um, that was presented to Jesus himself, um, who is my neighbor? So um, I think when, when theology engages with that sort of questions, uh, and even in, in, in uh, in in today's um, North American landscape, you know, well, one of the big questions we have to engage with is you know, um, is who is who is our neighbor? You know, how are we understanding that in in, in our highly uh, individualistic, consumeristic societies? How how do we respond to that? Right? Um, how is Jesus and the Spirit leading us to to respond? To that, um, and we responded yes through scripture, through conversation and dialogue with a um, with um, with other disciplines. So, for instance, um, I have a, a I have two people, a, a friend who uh, who's also doing doctoral studies, but also a, a, a pastoral colleague here. Who are very interested in um, uh, design? You know, how do we design uh, uh, urban spaces? Yes. And how do we design homes? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, what, do, what does that design say about uh, neighborhood uh, or being neighbors? Mm -hmm. what, what do they say about community? And, you know, I know people in Bolivia are asking themselves those questions too, right? You know, yeah. how, how do we use the public space? Right. So those, um, those are the questions that are, um, that are still relevant, uh, that uh, we should still um, be asking. And um, I think one of, the, one of the great contributions from Latin American theology is, is it's as simple as this, but as great as this, like that theology um, should keep asking questions, mm -hmm. should lead to people to asking questions mm -hmm. um, before providing answers mm -hmm. wow. or before making sure you have the right answers. Of course, there's doctrine. Of course, there's, we have from a, we come, you know, from a 2000 year old long history of uh, theological reflection and engagement. And we have to uh, honor that uh, and engage with that. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think that history should be used to ask questions wow. rather than come with rarely made answers. Mm. I prefer that. I like it. Let's do more of it. I feel that mm -hmm. it's actually the opposite. I feel that people who are <laughs> theologians or pastor types, and I'm, I don't want a blanket statement, everybody, but mm -hmm. they actually just want to have theology or conversation in order to shut down questions mm -hmm. in order to give us the answer. And, um, you know, and then what you're saying is actually the opposite of, of uh, to encourage those questions and dialogue and learn as well from what we understand of our of the past and the theologians and, and thinkers who have come before us, but also to have conversations and discussions now. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, and I think for even for every theologian, that, you know, can you imagine to be the, the, the theologian or the thinker who closes the debate, who closes yeah. the dialogue. I, I don't think like one would really want that, right? Yeah. We would want to deepen it, uh, enlighten it, we yes. want, but um, but not finish it. But sometimes we, you know, um, especially in, in in social media, uh, arguments and thinking is is used that way or for that purpose, you know, to shut the other one up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that that's totally coming from our Regent College background of mm -hmm. like the theology for everybody, the theology for the laity as well as for, for SETI as well, like that the founders are like, hey, this is going to be for everybody, not for the professional Christians or, you know what I mean, or I know more than you, but we actually all have questions and we all engage with and have a relationship with God that is hopefully just really authentic. Mm -hmm. Um, and real. So that, that's amazing. Wow. Thanks so much already for this conversation. I uh, know. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, let's move over to what you're learning through Ecclesiastes, um, which is this wisdom's literature in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Running? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know if I can fit in the running piece there. I, but, well, uh, I, I think I'm. Well, in the end, like, um, so I perceive, and, and, and I know that I'm not alone in this, that uh, there is a crisis of hope in society. Mm. Uh, it's hard to name it, it's hard to describe hope, um, and of course, it's hard to have it. And, um, you know, I, like, especially because of the pandemic uh, last year, but that's not the only situation that is, is rough. But but that's that's made everything sort of worse, right? Um, I remember, like, you know, nine months ago, like a meme circulated, uh, at least in, in 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 Spanish, it was saying um, it said something like, "The first year of the pandemic is the worst," yeah. and we all joke and laughed because we thought, I mean, this is gonna be a few more weeks and then it's gonna be gone, but. Right. 
Now it's sort of painful to remember that meme. You know, as funny as it is, because yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, it has been over a year, and, and yeah. we're still here, sort of. So there is this crisis of hope, um, and I know that I've experienced that myself. So um, reading Ecclesiastes has been actually a good experience for me uh, at this at this time, and um, it, reading Ecclesiastes through uh, with a, a Latin American. Um, biblical scholar, her name is Elsa Tamis. Um, so Elsa Tamis has wrote this commentary on Ecclesiastes many years ago, uh, but it, it talks about a, a, a faith of uh, closed horizons. I don't know if that's a correct translation, but it's sort of like, instead of like wide open, you know, panoram panoramic views, faith and life, you have this close sort of horizons, um, you know, so, but you still have faith in that. So, so her 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 approach to um, to um, to Ecclesiastes is, is from that angle, and um, so I've, I've been I've been uh, enjoying reading reading her. Um, so, but so this crisis of hope, though, like what I've been coming to realize is that it's it's not just because of the last year, um, but the last year has exposed it more. Because I, I you know if I started thinking about what was it, what was the tone and the content of the church's public wit witness mm -hmm. uh, in society before the pandemic? Yeah, right. And uh, so I came to to think, um, you know, maybe. Uh, pre-pandemic Christianity, let's call it that, uh, was one of uh, easy or at least quick answers mm. to things. Um, you know, maybe we thought or we acted, uh, and maybe sometimes I did myself, as if we could take on the world with our, you know, with our conferences, with our summits, with our books, with our ministries, with our programs. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we had a faith of answers that has been forced to transition to a faith of questions mm. and, and hard questions and for which we don't have answers yet. Right. Um, and, and if we read Ecclesiastes for which we might not have answers in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's why it's important to be part of a you know, long tradition mm -hmm. um, because we might not get to those answers in our lifetimes. Wow. You know? So I, I think that like uh, Ecclesiastes or Kohelet as, as, they, uh, as they're also called uh, the book, it, it helped me, helps me see that. Uh, and it's a bit of a sobering thought, um, mm. but, but I think it's, um, it's, it's more solid food than, um, than a very easy optimism, uh, you know, with which we, sometimes we, we try to feel better. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you know, I've been working uh, in Latin America for for over for 15 years. You no, know, Susanna and I work there, and I don't know if you know this, but like Latin America is uh, the world's most Christian region. Whoa. The, the, if you count uh, charismatics and Catholics and evangelicals, wow. those, it, there's more Christians there than anywhere else, right? So, for instance, it does make sense that, that now that the Pope is from Argentina, oh, it yeah. totally, totally makes sense. So good. But, um, so, it, it is, yes, so it's, it's that. Um, but before the pandemic hit, we were also the world's most unequal region. Mm. Uh-oh. With the most inequality, right, uh, and the most violent. Uh oh. The, we lived in a country in El Salvador uh, that, for you know, the time when we lived there, there were uh, many years ago there were there were more deaths daily than you know, than oh. in Iraq. Um, wow. So, um, and now, uh, you know, before and during the pandemic, Latin America is the has a record for the fastest rate of deforestation. So those are the things that you know, um, that were part of reality uh, in the most Christian of all continents. Goodness! Wow. So, um, so what what does it say about how we live faith? 
Mm -hmm. um, so there is no uh, there is no satisfactory um, answers to that. There is no s satisfactory shape to our um, to our theology. Okay. But um, again, even the shape of uh, of Ecclesiastes that it doesn't have. Uh, it, if you read the commentaries, like okay. the, there's big debates as to how the how the book is structured. Right. Yeah. Uh, so even that, to me, mm -hmm. what um, made sense, if you will, mm -hmm. they're like, it's okay if we we don't know how things are structured at this time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it makes sense that that the book would be written in this, let's call it unstructured way, uh, because reality itself it, like presents itself. You know, uh, wow. it's presented that in, in that shape. Yeah. Hard to hard to hard to take in, hard to describe. So, so therefore, theology can be that way, and you you still be you're still faith you're still called to be faithful, right. uh, in the fear of the Lord in that time. So, um, so yeah, that means so those are some of the reasons why I, I keep you know, getting drawn to to the to the book. Um, so, and, and some of the other th uh, things that. And call me to the book uh, of Ecclesiastes is that um, it deconstructs a lot of the things that, um, and we learned this in, in, in seminary, like, you know, sometimes wisdom can be presented or understood in this sort of like cause and effect. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you do this and things will go this way, you know. Right. Uh, and, and Ecclesiastes says, well, not necessarily. Oh, no. and, uh, and we you know we don't understand and there's still a lot of uh, unfair things so um you know wisdom is not a protective shield against suffering and that has been painfully true wow. this year this past yeah. year for us you know um with all the death uh, that has happened mm -hmm. so um you know death does not take virtue or vice into consideration uh, it's it it happens. It comes to uh -huh. so um, so that calls to humbleness, right? Um, and one, but something that has been good for me in that humbleness, even in making this transition in Vancouver, was that uh, you know, in the past, my perception of the ministries working with the homeless in organizations working with the homeless in Vancouver, was there was a bit of a sense of territoriality of, you know, like, you know, I'm doing the coolest thing or the best thing and, and this one, no, we're doing. Uh -huh. But because it's so hard to to do the things that you have to, that you used to do, these grand visions, we're all a lot humbler. Mm. Uh, and and I've had, I've been able to have really profound and, um, encouraging conversations with other ministries as oh. to how we can partner wow. both explicitly and implicitly recognizing that um, we are by ourselves uh, do not have answers we do yeah. not have the you know the the solutions that we thought we did yeah. and so so again Ecclesiastes speaks to that mm -hmm. you know? so um, I don't know. Should, should I keep going? On, on well, uh, I, I just want to tell people who have joined the call, if you have questions, totally make a comment and ask your questions. And, you know, if you have embarrassing stories about David, you can also write, write them <laughs> as well. Or if you just want to say hi, you can make comments. And, and then, like, if you have questions, then, you know, David will answer all of your questions. <laughs> or or I will bring you other questions. That's right. <laughs> Or answer your question with another question. Um, man, that really helps, I think. For But unfortunately, I think we want answers. I think mm -hmm. we like it when it's simple. I think we like when it's just really black and white, yes or no, heaven or hell, you know. And so, but to be living in uh, a place that we find ourselves right now where it's not as easy, I think uh. it actually you know, like you said, it makes, it makes us more humble, and that's good. And it also means that we need to rely on each other, which is good. 
I want to give you a story about a friend of mine. She's, I don't think she's a Christian and she wasn't at the time for sure, but we were just talking and I encouraged her to read the book of Job. And then months and months later, I totally forgot. She's like, Hey, Anne, I wrote that. I read that book you told me to read. I was like, Oh, what book? She goes, Job. I'm like, Oh, that book. And she's like, I read it and I just don't get it. Anne. she's like, why? We basically had like a Bible study and she's like, why does, did God use such an angry racist man? I'm like, fantastic question. That is a, an excellent question because, yeah, he was, Job was super angry, total racist. To, you know what I mean? And mm. he's like vengeful. He's like, go get him, God, kill him. And then he was really mad when God actually extended mercy to them. And I was like, yeah, doesn't that just give you hope, though? You know, we're talking about hope that God even in spite of ourselves, in spite of our own brokenness and racism and anger, that God still chooses to use us, even if we don't even want to be used. We're like, no, I don't want to be used. But... Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Are, are, um, are you referring to Jonah? Um, oh, sorry, Jonah. Yes, sorry, yeah. not Jonah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Jonah. No, yes, absolutely. It's, yeah, great question, eh? Yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> It's this is kind of thing that happens when you um, when you read the Bible with other people, you know, right. outside the, the traditional circles. So, um, I mean, one of the one of the challenges here, like as as I was saying at the beginning at First Baptist, is that uh, we have to do this um, hospitality and welcoming without um, without a building which you know we always say that the the building is not the church but we we definitely operate as it is right yeah, so, right. so um mm. so you no know, we have to we have to do it in a different way we have to um think about and do hospitality with people you know that we that might stretch us um uh, that might have different questions and approaches um so you know how how do we remain faithful in that? How do we keep remain humble in that? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's definitely the, the the sort of context that is um, leading us to I, I think a deeper faith, uh, but but it's not easy for sure. It's it's, it's um mm -hmm. it's complex. Um, and you you mentioned something that was um. Uh, um well, yeah, was part of the was part of the Ecclesiastes um, and theology, if you want. And he does advocate for enjoyment mm. uh, as sort of the, the wisest course of action in the time. But I, I don't think it's, uh, you know, um, people might take that as um, sort of escapism, you know, mm. enjoy it. But, oh, yeah. but you know, I... I um, um, I I heard this song in in Portuguese actually one uh, one time in, from this you know his name escapes me oh uh, but well, the the song's name is um, uh, a luz de tieta is the the light of tieta uh, um, something like that but it it it's like you hear the the um, um, a Caetano Veloso is the, is the name uh, of the. Um, let me um, let me write yeah. down. I wonder if I can write down. Uh, in, okay. Yes, uh, Luz. Uh, Luz the, I think <laughs> that's the name of the. I think I think I posted. Okay. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's a very upbeat um, rhythm. So like sounds like Brazilian samba or something like that, but um, but it asks questions about uh, about what Brazilian society values, and mm -hmm. but it does it in this enjoying enjoying sort of or enjoyable rhythm. Yeah. And so you're dancing, but he's asking really deep questions about how meaningless many things are about uh, Brazilian society as he experiences it, and you're like. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's sort of that's the right approach, 
Like mm. you ask these questions um, and you get people to dance, but mm. you know, but you ask those questions. Um, and there's so this celebration is mm -hmm. is part of how we are called to live through this time. Mm -hmm. um, so not through it, so that but it doesn't result in escapism, but it it feeds you so that you can engage. Wow, that's so um, good. society. So um, anyhow, I was just um, there. Um, yeah, I, I was touched by that. So that and, and I saw some some points of connection with Ecclesiastes um, because he does that. Okay, like I said, uh, you know, uh, enjoyment um, as much as he advocates for sure. Right, right after that, the fear of the Lord, uh, being aware that um, that there is someone who's much larger, who's, who we will not be able to explain away with our theology, mm -hmm. uh, even, uh, that is, uh, that is, yeah, the, the center and the meaning of everything. So for him, I mean, uh, Ecclesiastes uses the, the term fear of the Lord wow. for that awareness. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so there's a question, but I'm going to, and I'm going to, but Carrie's asking, hi, Carrie, in helping followers of Jesus share their faith, where should we begin? Wow, we've been asking that question at, at church um, uh, recently and say, how do we understand evangelism? Um, you know, um, I, I don't have a ready answer for that. I think it depends on, on, on the relationship and the context that you might have with, with other people. Um, I tend, and I think it's a good place to start, but I, I don't offer it as a blanket answer, uh, with questions about what people are hopeful for. Uh, and, you know, but questions, not with the attitude of like, you know, as soon as they are finished, I'll bring Jesus in, you know, as the answer. But um, with questions about really what, uh, what they are... Um, what do they look forward to? You no, know, what gets them out of bed? And um, what, yeah, and what, or or what keeps them there? You know, why why is hard? So, um, in that way, we might um, we might understand, you know, how um, what Jesus or the gospel might have to say or ask about that situation or that story. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's that's where I would begin. Yeah. Well, also, I think it maybe was what you were just saying about Ecclesiastes is about enjoyment. I think if we actually enjoy our friends mm -hmm. and just our true friends um, and really appreciating who they are, and then you just like have this natural empathy and want to know more about them. And um, one time we had a really huge conflict at the University of British Columbia when I was on staff with InterVarsity. <laughs> Because there was a, a huge issue that happened um, between the Marxists and also the Catholics who were who had like um, a pro-life booth and the Marxists came and destroyed the booth. Mm. They, they came and just ripped everything up with screaming and it was really interesting. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. We Anyway, so... What we actually got together was both groups, the Catholics, the pro-life people, and the Marxists over pizza. And people were on two different sides of the room, and all of us in varsity people were sitting in the middle. <laughs> but they expected a fight. They thought they, that they actually came, and they thought they were going to get bruised up just by us beating on them. But we actually just asked them, hey, so we just want to get to know you and know each other. And we all share this huge we're very passionate about justice so we just wanted to know where did that come from where did you get your sense of justice and uh, it brought up like an incredible conversation from both sides and everybody eventually sat down and just had pizza and started really we're really quite vulnerable and honest mm. about the, the pain that they have experienced in their life which then made them want to fight on behalf of those who are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Wow. I feel like that, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's what you're doing. 
Wow, yeah, facilitating a space of conversation between those groups. And the Catholics I mean, said it was the most wow. powerful moment they had on campus. Mm -hmm. And the Marxists started coming to our uh, our our groups, large groups. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Who knew, but, right? Yes, who knew that um, um, the power of pizza? <laughs> you know, I know. But, but no, I mean, there is, um, you know, missiologically speaking, like you know, sitting at the table with someone um, is is a powerful, um, powerful action, you know, pow powerful gesture, and um, hospitality, right? Hospitality, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna. Uh, yeah, just like we didn't have an agenda. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to have a ask a question, but have a conversation. We didn't even know what the questions were that you know, we were going to mm -hmm. ask. It, just was, it was pretty awesome, and I still remember that. Um, I'm going to go back as well, like to your Aluzatieta story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was in Wisconsin, the middle of the U.S., and um, I actually joined a gospel choir. Oh, cool. So, and, like, I was the only non-Black person <laughs> in the choir. I'm like, hello. Wow. And, you know, but they extended hospitality to me, too, and I'm grateful. Because clearly, they said, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, I'm trying. Um, and then they taught me their songs, and it was just really incredible. But that's also hospitality, too, when you extend yourself, knowing that, I'm in a very new space, probably uncomfortable. Um, but what they do is they also have enjoyment too mm -hmm. through their music and through their culture. And they sing their theology. Like they mm -hmm. sing hope and they, in the midst of something, like in when they were enslaved, it's not like they had the option of like, oh yeah, I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to go now. Like they were suffering for s hundreds of years, right? So it's like, wow. And I think we have a lot to learn. Like we have a lot to learn from, um, honestly, our black brothers and sisters, and as well, like our brothers and sisters from Latin America. You have a lot to teach us. There, there is a lot of um, of overlooked experiences and reflection, um, and I think it is. It is. Uh, you're right. I think it is the the privilege. And the duty of uh, theologians of institutions to um, to be mindful of that wealth uh, of experience and reflection that happens in um, in the church in, in marginal communities, um, because after all, um, our faith and our Savior um, uh, lived in those spaces. You know, uh, was was originated in those spaces. So. Yeah, we have to. We have that privilege and that that duty. And it's not. It's not easy. It takes work, mm -hmm. and and sometimes it doesn't turn out well. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's 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 Ecclesiastes again. But mm -hmm. uh, but fear of the Lord and that call for enjoyment. You, you we're still called to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know how there's the African Bible Commentary, the ABC. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there an equivalent for? Yes. Oh. Yes, yes. Um, the, this uh, the, the, it's called the contemporary um, uh, Latin American uh, commentary, some, something like that. It was. Um, it came out not too long ago, maybe uh, four four years ago or something like that. So there is that, but it's not in English. Oh no! It's in okay. Spanish, but, oh, no. but there is there is a commentary. There is a couple commentaries uh, like that that, that take uh, several uh, Latin American authors and uh, they. Uh, Oh man, that'd be so great. Yeah, they should translate those. Yes. I really hope they're translating it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, yes. <laughs> For all of us who are like totally sad and are not fluent in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's good to know. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to try to, I don't know, find one. Maybe that's in English. Maybe you can help me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah there, there is some. Um, uh, there's some some good authors too that have written um, in in English from Latin America. They, um, okay. they're, they're very um, very good. Yeah, very good to read.
Okay. Um, hey, De well, I think we're coming up to the hour, so I want to like, but um, I h hope you know that Mary Hom was ho thinking about joining Instagram to oh, yes. <laughs> join our session, and as well, Michael Theopolis. Oh, really? Wow, Michael. Yeah. Yes. He also I'm reached out. Like, yeah. He's like, I'm not an Instagram, but maybe um, I can figure this out. Yeah, I'm hardly here. Like, I really don't post my, like, yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, so I guess kind of sort of behind on the, on the technology. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, this was the right way. This was the right way. It was really fun. Um, yeah, it was fun. I'm going to download, I'm going to save it on Instagram. I'm also going to download it. And I also upload to, uh, I have a tiny little YouTube channel now where I upload. Oh, right all of these like sessions so that other people can, who are, don't have Instagram uh, can watch. I, I do want to say thank you for inviting me. Well, it is a privilege. I, I remember all the way back in region, uh, you having this amazing coordination and organizing skills uh, <laughs> for you know, getting people together. Um, yeah. And the story that you shared just uh, confirms that more. But even I remember your role in that um, Lausanne um, conference, mm -hmm. just uh, you know, helping people um, come to or make a reality, you know, of the, their plans and their visions. And uh, uh, yeah, so so that's a, that's quite a skill. Uh, that's something that is badly needed in many yeah. places. So kudos on that. And congratulations on, on the good work. Okay. It's so, talk about enjoyment. It's so fun. Mm -hmm. And it's really my joy because then I actually get to really watch the global church come together in, in powerful ways and having those incredible conversations, you know, even over coffee in, in Indonesia. How mm -hmm. awesome is that? Yeah. And you're like, look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my pleasure. So I'm so glad you're back in Canada. I'm glad that you're back in Vancouver. Maybe I'm hoping, maybe I'll be able to come. I'm thinking there might be actually an event that I'm planning there in January. Oh, great. Yes. So, so it would be really fun to do and hang out with all of our friends who are still in the Vancouver area. Yes. Well, I mean, once the, once the COVID restrictions are lifted, right? And uh, yes, yes. And meanwhile, we have to be a bit. Yeah, less less enthusiastic about. It. I've only been to re the region campus once, and uh, and I couldn't really get in because the library is well anyhow. But um, it was it, uh, yeah, it was good to see it from from the outside. I purchased a book, uh, and it was it was a great experience to have. Oh, man, I'm really jealous mm -hmm. actually that you live so close to region. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You know, I did want to. I, I forget. I forgot to say something about Ecclesiastes. That uh, it's, it's an idea that I'm still sort of. Uh, coming to terms, um, you know, you know that victory was accomplished in the cross, right? And, um, yeah. So, and I'm just thinking about that because it's, it's, it was Easter um, mm -hmm. four days ago. So um, I was, how paradoxical it is that the, the victory was actually accomplished on the cross, right? Yeah. Um, and so, Faith, so just, again, my all my thoughts are not formed on this, but like, so paradox is, is, a, is an important part of faith. Um, so in in this times, I, I think it is helpful to remember that. And I, I just read this, um, this article by, by this French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur. He talks about how how this paradox works and, and you know, leads me to, to or, or he, he, he argues that um, the Christian hope, and we started talking about hope, and, and so Christian hope is the rescuing, the saving, not only of the meaning of our lives, but also of the paradox of our lives. Right. So, so probably hope, should not be about you know, the cancelling of paradox, mm -hmm. um, mm. but the rescuing of it. I, and mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what that looks like, what that entails. Um, but I know that, for instance, in, in, in heaven, as much as we will see being the presence of God, we won't understand everything about God, mm -hmm. because he would cease to be God, right? Even in heaven. Um, uh, so, you know, 
maybe paradox still exists, but it is redeemed in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, just that. I, hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, our faith, the Christian faith, really calls us to live in tension. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we, for example, you know what I mean? Like what you said with the Latin American church, like it's the most Christian areas of the world. And yet, you know, how, why is it, you know, that then so much injustice and environmental, you know, devastation still happens. Mm -hmm. So like there's that paradox but also there's the paradox that <laughs> of power like that god actually speaks to those who are we consider powerless mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and those that we that are what that we consider invaluable like unvaluable mm -hmm. not important god speaks to them to them and they hear and they obey and come to faith in God, like that's what happens in the Old Testament all the time. Like all these people who heard the voice of God and obeyed, even though they weren't God followers, and then they acknowledge God and and become God followers, God seekers. And the people that we expect to know everything, all the you know, the people in power missed entirely the voice of God in their lives. Mm. And that there's that paradox too, and that that actually gives me hope because I feel like I'm one of those people that people don't traditionally consider somebody with power. Like they mm. would, you know, when I walk into a room, people don't think power. Mm. They don't, they don't see me as somebody with mm. power. They actually don't know if I speak English. right? So like, mm -hmm. Oh, you speak English. And you're like, wow. But I, it gives me hope because I think I know that God uses people. And mm -hmm. speak to me as well, just as powerfully, if I'm, if I have my eyes open and ears open and heart open to his voice and leading in my life. So there's that paradox. And I'm into that paradox. And, and until, yeah, and one day they will be, they will be redeemed. Um, mm -hmm. but great. Thank you for, for your, your, thinking of me for this space uh, it was fun it was it was a great conversation for me to have oh my goodness well i'm so glad like honestly i've been tracking <laughs> i've been tracking from a distance but it's so awesome to actually have a conversation and to really learn from you and thank you for honestly all that you do and the thoughtfulness that you do not only your theology but also how you live and also your ministry so just really grateful and can't wait for many more years to come for our friendship. Amen. Amen. Okay. God bless. God bless you. Bye, Anne. Bye, thanks. thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. <laughs>